How exactly can you get mythological stuff out of Pokemon? You seriously are off your rocker, Charles. You're insane. You spent way too much time at the con. You're get off my to... couch. And I got it off your guess. Yes, yes. I'm a little crazy. I'm a little zany. I'm a little nuts. No, I bear with me here. Seriously, bear with me here. Well, event. This here is Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell is kind of a hero of mine. I don't need a mic. Microphone, no. Hell no. I got a strong voice. Y'all can hear me. I won't be able to talk by tomorrow, but who cares? <laughs> Joseph Campbell is one of my heroes. He was a mythologist. A, he gathered a lot of folklore. He gathered a lot of classic and sacred stories. I first heard about him in the 1980s when he did a special called The Power of Myth. He sat down with a man named Bill Moyers and they talked about how Star Wars is a mythology for the modern world. I discovered who he was and started reading about him. He's written a lot of really great books like the Masks of God series where he talks about the different traditions. He wrote The Hero of a Thousand Faces detailing the monomyth, the story of a young boy who grows up and fulfills their duty. He broke down how mythology mirrors our journey on Earth. He talks about how mythology itself is more than just a story or two with, say, a guy with a hammer beaten down on mountains. But it was a story about the guy with the hammer that lives inside us and beats down mountains. It was the story of how myths mirror the world we live in. Myths are a representation of our life. You are not manning your station car. <laughs> They resonate with us. They're powerful, strong stories because we see ourselves in them. They mirror the interactions that we have throughout life, the people we meet, the family that supports us, the enemies we fight against. They have, they're allegorical to our journey on Earth. They're supposed to feel organic because they mirror the organic journey we take from the moment we are born until the moment we die and wherever we may go in the end. So. How does Pokemon fit into this? Well, let's be quite honest here. Mythology evolves. There's a beautiful book. Who here is a Neil Gaiman fan? Who here read the book American Gods? American Gods is a wonderful example of how mythology evolves. And in this book, it's about a, a guy named Shadow who one day is riding an airplane home from prison when he bumps into Odin. And Odin starts talking to him about the war between the American gods, the gods of consumerism, cars, airplanes, and modern world, facing off against the gods of old. The gods of old have no worshippers, they're losing power. One of my favorite scenes is when we talk about how Thor committed suicide in a hotel room in Detroit. <laughs> and I love the book because it talked a lot about this level of mythology. And there's, an, there's a point in here where Shadow goes into a room. And this first room he sees is all the gods we know. We know their names, we know their stories, we know their history, and he sees these gods. There's a door in the back of the room. He walks into that next room, and there are more gods in there. These are the gods that are known to the academics, where we know we may know their name and where they're from, but we know nothing about their ritual. We know nothing about their followers. We know nothing about their personal stories. There's another door in the back of that room. He walks through that door, and they're the gods that we forgot. The gods that disappeared into the annals of history, never to be remembered again, because their worshippers all died out. That's mythology, people. Like every other part of human, human society, mythology either, either evolves or it goes away. When you gods lose their worshippers, they disappear. When stories stop being told, they disappear. Another great analogy, who here is a fan of Tiny Toon Adventures? If no one believes, Tinkerbell dies. <laughs> that too. In that episode of, of, uh, of that episode of, um, where, 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 where Gogo and the, and the other weirdos are taken out of their world? No, I'm talking about the one with Bosco and Honey. Oh, way more important. <laughs> yeah, Carl, Bosco and Honey. So this notion of, if people don't remember, everything goes away. It's, the stories themselves will stick around, but things will change. At one point, it was a bunch of drunk guys with beards and horned helmets screaming at each other about Thor before they beat each other upside the head with hammers. Now, coming next year, Thor 2, starring Chris Hemsworth. <laughs> that same kind of notion where we take the characters and the characters evolve. The symbols still hold meaning, whether they're in a book or on a screen. <laughs> yes, Psyduck, seriously, Pokemon. Mythology, it's rooted in art and culture. These stories come from our past. They use symbolism, they use metaphor, they try to tell a story in an interesting way using interesting language. They use compelling characters. 
We are meant to relate to people like Theseus. We are meant to relate to people like Luke Skywalker. It's evocative. It makes us feel strong emotion. It's interactive. Without a community, the story goes away. We get to build on this. We get to take back from it. I have, um, I met earlier this summer uh, Dr. William Ellis from Penn State University talking about community mythology and My Little Pony. <laughs> I'll tell you more about that later, but he's writing an essay on it for a book I'm compiling. So you know what? So does Pokemon, because all you need to do is lift up the top, throw away the characters, and look a little bit deeper inside, and you're going to find some great stuff. You've got this notion that the stories that we have give birth to the Pokemon themselves. You see an interesting, excuse me, monster? Create a Pokemon out of it. This notion of growing up, becoming an adult, God forbid, going out into the world and succeeding. It works because you are Ash, well, you're fancy Ash. You are Ash, no, you're Terry Bogart, aren't you? <laughs> is, there a, is Ash Ketchum in the room? I'll settle for Team Rocket Girl. <laughs> but then the dark next, side of Ash Ketchum. I could be Giovanni. You could be Giovanni if you want to be. No, so then you have this notion of the world we live in, great, normal, ordinary, suddenly distortion world shows up where you can walk on, walk on walls and things come flying at you from all directions where we encounter a world that we've never seen before and it, and it kind of, well, I got kind of scared playing Distortion World for the first time. You are required to trade to catch them all, unless you're like me and you trade Pokemon with yourself because you have four DSs. <laughs> you ain't seen nothing yet till you've battled yourself and lost. <laughs> it's been known to happen. Now let me ask, any Pokemon Masters in the room? Anyone beat the Elite Four at least once? Anyone beat the Elite Four at least once today? <laughs> You, sir, are awesome. <laughs> oh. So, Pokemon mirrors this in a number of ways. We've got the hero, the stories of the hero's journey, the notions of villains and rivalries, bonds, strength in bonds, and of course, the tiny little things trapped in gigantic balls. So, we'll start with the coming of age. This was where Joseph Campbell really started his whole notion about, about um, the monomyth. So, you start as a young girl or a teenager in hot pants. <laughs> Your parents give you 20,000 yen and tell you, okay, time to leave the house. Now, if I was 10 years old and my mom did that to me, she'd be arrested for child abuse. But in Pokemon, it's perfectly okay. So you are forced to learn things like self-reliance. Did all your Pokemon get knocked out because you spent all your money on balls in the first town? You shouldn't have done that. I'm tripping balls. Exactly. <laughs> this notion of learning how to budget, don't blow all your money in the game corner, don't blow all your money on crap you can't use. I remember once I spent all my money on um, proteins only to find out that I could only use two or three per Pokemon. <laughs> and then I had all these proteins there and I'm like, damn it, I have no money left. You use the rest of your money on those four dances. <laughs> <laughs> two of them were presents. So then you have this notion of self-reliance goes to bonds between allies. Friendship. You need to, especially in later generations of the game, if you don't work well with your friends, you lose. If you're being jumped by six guys at once and you don't have your friend by your side, you lose. The idea of the master and the weapon. You can't just be, have strong bonds with your friend, you need to have strong bonds with your Pokemon. What a, a wonderful example drawn from j classical Japanese culture. The samurai had two swords. One was the wakizashi that stayed by his side at all times that he would use when he needed it. The other was the katana. If you disrespected the katana, it was a samurai's duty to kill you. The bond between master and weapon was so strong, it was seen as the weapon was a living part of the master. You see this in Pokemon. If you do not take care of your Pokemon, he does not listen to you. If you do not take care of your Pokemon, he will turn around when you're in that gym battle, laugh at you, then get knocked out. <laughs> then you have to go back to the Pokemon Center. If you don't take care of your Pokemon, you get Charmeleon from the anime. <laughs> but it's not just master and weapon. It's also rivalries. Facing down that person that is meant to make you a better person. Are you good enough to defeat your rival? Are you good enough to survive? Move on to the next stage. If you can't beat your rival, you go back to the Pokemon Center and do this lovely thing called grinding. Anyone who's ever played a Japanese RPG knows that it is the point of Japanese RPGs. <laughs> Pokemon is no different. Or MMORPGs. Yeah, MMORPGs. Well, MMORPGs give you quests. 
So it's not really grinding, is it? Unless you're doing dailies. That's another, that's another panel for another day. <laughs> but then you've got this notion of evil. The all-encompassing, super-powered evil that you need to fight against. Because you're young, and you're pure, and you know that you're going to stand up for justice and righteousness. Wait, what is that army doing over there? <laughs> wait, wait. I have to fight that? <laughs> are, are you, I'm, I'm only ten. Somebody call Luffy. Yeah. <laughs> this notion of facing off against the ultimate evil. Do you, are you an adult? This is like, you're going to become an adult now. You have to beat up every single person in that army. Fortunately, all they have is, uh, all they have is like coffins. So <laughs> fire typing is fine. But what have you learned? Do you know enough to face down the big bad and save the day? The whole of the story is towards facing the big bad and saving the day. So Joseph Campbell and Carl Jung began to break down the characters that showed up in their stories into these archetypes. And each archetype has certain characteristics that are universal to that archetype. Let's just show you the first one. The everyman, the typical person. Me, you, you you're a god though. <laughs> you, him, Scott over there, then Waldo. I found Waldo. <laughs> yeah, but this idea of they're the normal person. The everyman is you. It's, it's meant to be the person with no experience, just starting out, no special powers, no crazy anything. You at the beginning of your life when you are indistinguishable from everybody else. Mm -hmm. And as the story progresses, you start to grow. Now, Pokemon does the best method of doing this. It's, uh, you just name the character after yourself. Uh, one of my friends, Chris, uh, aka Kalika, names all his Pokemon characters Surf Bum. Because he is a surf bum. My characters are all named after characters from a fantasy novel series my girlfriend and I have been writing for the last three years. So each game is a different character. This is Kaylin. She doesn't look like that in the book, but all her Pokemon are fighting types. Because Kaylin uses nothing but fighting types. That is a hard way to beat the game, by the way. Fighting types are not Elite Four compatible. <laughs> but what you can name the character after yourself. You, there's no rule to what kind of Pokemon you should... Hey, Master Shake. There's no rule for what kind of Pokemon you have to have. There's no rule that says you must do this in order to proceed. The story is there. You do what you want with it. Then we have the Holy Fool. Bumbling, irresponsible, comic, a little stupid. These are the guys that get into and get out of trouble very keenly. They're meant to break the mood. They're meant to break the monotony and make things fun. I like how you said Brock. That is not who I use, though. They are about as hard as <laughs> so let's think about it. They don't know how to battle. They never win a fist Do right. you want to know how these are the holy fools? They're the only Pokemon trainers in the world whose Pokemon evolved because they felt sorry for them. <laughs> <laughs> they cried and weeped, poured their life into their Zanga, and next thing you know, their Pokemon evolved. Not that their Pokemon were any better after they evolved. <laughs> but they evolved nonetheless. The companion. The support system. Yeah? I just want to add, seeing Magikarp, they got better. But after evolving to a Gyarados, <laughs> because Gyarados is awesome. That was the whole point of that game. Release the Kraken. I can do. doom. However, oh, it was me. However, don't forget, level 100 Magikarp can take out elites. I've seen the video. So, then you have the companion, the support system. Because no one should be forced to go at it alone. So, I ain't. You don't go at it alone. Same okay. Nobody has to go at it alone. You always have that person who helps you, who gets you through to the next stage. The one who is forever by your side. Sam to your Frodo. Al to your Ed. Luigi to your Mario. Pokemon, it's pretty much, it's pretty much just the Pokemon themselves. <laughs> Pikachu is the royal Pikachu. It could be a Pikachu, it could be a Hitmonchan, it could be a Candelure, whatever Pokemon you want. They will always be by your side, and based on how you treat it, determines how much it loves you. See my previous example about the Charmeleon. <laughs> so then we have the mentor, the teacher. This is the one in the beginning of your life that teaches you everything you need to know to go on your hero's quest. This is your Obi-Wan Kenobi. 
This is your, this is your, uh, your uh, Kiran. This is the guy who helps you. Yeah, yeah you're Gandalf. <laughs> <laughs> Pokemon, you are a graduate student. <laughs> you are doing your professor's field work for him. Uh, I should know. Uh, so we got plenty of open seats right over here on this side. Coming up to the front, come on up. We have a water cooler, we have a lovely trash can, we have the Riddler. We have the Riddler. And, and Sylvester McCoy, so we have the Question Masters square off. Okay, but yeah, that's, that's Professor Oak. He teaches you how to battle, he gives you your first Pokemon, he, he summons you back to his lab occasionally to ch check on your progress and make sure you're doing things well. What I love is in one of the games, I went through the entire game with four Pokemon and he would yell at me. <laughs> Why do you only have four Pokemon? You have six spaces on your team. Yeah, well one of them's a Mewtwo. <laughs> the anti-hero. Here we have, I'm using the Jungian version. Mm -hmm. Carl Jung talks about the anti-hero not as like the bad guy, but as the guy who is atypical morality. He's not really a bad guy. Often, he's just as noble as the hero, but his methods are a little bit questionable. Cyclops will shoot the bad guy's gun out of his hand. Wolverine will take his head off. <laughs> Beast will put him in a bear hug. Wolverine will take his head off. <laughs> Superman will pick the guy up. Batman will drop him off the side of a building. <laughs> this is what I mean by anti-hero. There's it's still noble. Still the heart is in the right place. But you take the head off. Methods are a little questionable. Well, Pokemon gave a great one with N. Oh, no. I gotta just say this. I do not have a problem with this guy's with this guy's message. Treat your Pokemon well. Be a good master. Take care of your Pokemon and treat them as if you would like to be treated yourself. That doesn't mean you should break the bond. You don't get it, N. You did by the end after he got pimp slapped by you and your restroom or your restroom. <laughs> this whole notion, yeah. Oh, what? You're, you're agreeing with me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so who here, who here was black and who here was, I was white, I was who here was black? See, I played it safe, I played it very political, I went right down the middle, I chose Pokemon Obama. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't there to offend anybody, I was hoping for a change. Okay, so, so now we have the rival, not the villain, not the anti-hero. This guy's got one job in mythology and, he ha and all it is is simple, challenge you. Make sure you're ready. That's his entire job, is to get you ready by constantly trolling you. Oh, did you next time catch it? <laughs> sort of. Pokemon? Yeah. 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 Motherfucker. Language? Sorry. <laughs> Although I was about to say that myself. <laughs> you got all your Pokemon are knocked out, you're five tiles from the Pokemon Center, who comes out the door and challenges you to a duel? <laughs> Gary Oak is everything you're not. He's popular with the ladies. He has really powerful Pokemon. He has a driver's license. <laughs> Everything, you have a bicycle. Everything that you wish you were, Gary Oak is, and he reminds you of that constantly. Next. There's nine badges, you got ten. Now, he's got, yeah. You have nine badges, he has ten. There's, there's, like, there's eight in the game, he has ten. Yeah. Oh God. The godlike villain. This is the big bad. This is who you must persevere against in order to defeat. This is your Palpatine, your Sauron, your Hasatan, your great evil that you must come up against. Often, well, you know what's a good example way of looking at this? Him. Giovanni. Let's look at Giovanni for a second. Great vampire clan. He is a gym leader. <laughs> he is the guardian of the Elite Four. He runs a multinational business conglomerate. He kidnapped Mew and created a genetically monstrous version of him. Wait, are we talking about Giovanni or, or Rupert Murdoch? Both. <laughs> okay. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know who Murdoch is. Giovanni is about as bad as they come, and you have to beat him. Look at that face. And you beat him with authority. <laughs> Next. So, moving on a little bit to the world mythology, because we've seen how 
The Campbellian mythology is mirrored in Pokemon, the archetypes and the stories themselves. But a lot of times, Pokemon likes to grab, especially beyond Gen 1, they like to grab these notions and make them the meta plot for the entire game. We'll, we'll start with something basic, some creation stories. Because in the beginning, some stuff happened and we came along. A lot of Pokemon games have one, like the story of the dragons fighting atop the dragon tower and there's where the world came from. Or the story of Mew begat everything. But one of my favorite ones is Gen 4. Yeah. In the beginning, there was Arceus, and it was good. And Arceus begat the Alga and Palkia, and bade them to create the islands of Japan. I'm not making this up, it's in the game. <laughs> Gen 4 is the most religious of the games. It mirrors Shinto mythology. You've got your progenitor who created the first man. No, no, man, this one has a boob. The first man and the first woman and had them create the world. This game took that notion of we have God, you can catch him now. You really can catch them all. But you also have these notions of battle. These, there's all the mythology is full of these stories, like you, I gave the apocalypse between heaven and hell. Ragnarok. Ragnarok. These notions where powerful beings do battle, and all mankind can do is this. <laughs> <laughs> so, Pokemon really had a lot of fun with this. It gave us something that's based on this little, this little uh, Hebrew line here. And they will interlock with one another and engage in combat. With his horns, Behemoth will gore with strength, and Leviathan will need to leap, him, him, leap to meet him with his fins with power. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the plot to Gen 3. Yeah. The notion of the beast of the land, Behemoth, versus the beast of the oceans, Leviathan. Now, Rayquaza... And the advice of the Sky Dragon. <laughs> <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> Rayquaza is an interesting concept. There's the story of Leviathan and Behemoth. If you look at the Babylonian version, there's a sky monster called Ziz who comes down, kills them, eats them, and then goes on a rampage. <laughs> if you follow the Hebrew version, that's God coming down to, pet, to squelch the two of them and throw them into hell. But that's the whole point of Gen 3, is this cosmic battle between Earth and water, and there's nothing we can do about it unless we beat their team. <laughs> now we're going to get a little bit more philosophical. Taoism, the notion of the, ba the balance of between forces. How everything is both good and bad, life and death, light and dark. There's no polar nature found within Taoism. Everything is perpetual harmony. That one, in order for one to exist, so must the other to keep things in balance. Or as Isaac Newton would say, every action has its equal and opposite reaction. That's just the way the universe works. Pokemon gave us the yin yang Pokemon. Reshiram and Zekrom. The only way to defeat one is with the other. Forever they will be interlocked in battle, neither one gaining advantage over the other, but their balance must be attained or the world will fall into darkness. It doesn't hurt that one of them is white and one of them is black, like a yin-yang, constantly moving in a circle. Now, black two and white two introduce Qurum, Wuji, nothingness. I'm going to love to see how they put that in the game. Every story has a villain, and I'm not talking about the godlike villain at this point. I'm talking about the Jungian shadow, anger strong, destructive emotion, vile thoughts, vile actions, nightmares, the things that have no form but terrify the hell out of us, that creep into our houses at night and bring us torment, that fly through the galaxy devouring and destroying everything in their Rupert path. Murdoch. <laughs> what does it give us? Oh, shoot. Gear what? Okay. What is Giratina? Giratina is all of Arceus, Diago, and Palkia's negative emotions given form, and because it was evil and destructive, it was banished to a netherworld where it couldn't harm another person. So Team Galactic let it out. Oh, okay. So we have anger, dark ride, nightmares, feeding off your, the crazy dreams, coming into the world and scaring the hell out of you. Dark, dark ride and Giratina are this notion of darkness, vile nightmare coming into the world to smite you. So this one was another one of the things I, I uh, used to create this panel. There's a long-standing tradition of mankind being the thing that creates the weapon that destroys itself. We will eventually, we have nuclear weapons that we will use to blow ourselves up. We have this, the notion that we will dally in the realm of the gods 
and if we're not careful, Adam will rise out of Antarctica, flood the world, and then Shinji Akari needs a job. <laughs> but this notion I got my wife back. I got my wife back. <laughs> no, you turned into Orange Tang. And he is delicious. Because you bad touched her clothes. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my, Evan, my token Evangelion joke. No, this notion that mankind will create the, the arbit, harbinger of our own destruction shows up in Greek mythology, it shows up in Zoroastrian mythology, it shows up in Hebrew mythology, it shows up everywhere. Well, Pokemon gave us something like a lot of fun with it. Let me explain. This... And the Gen 1 was the genetic base for Pokemon. It was power incarnate, but it was compassionate, innocent, cute, very loving. The kind of being that, while it could destroy the world, never would because it was so innocent. Until mankind got their hands on it. Stripped out the compassion, stripped out the innocence because it makes it weaker. Magnify its raw destructive power, then try to control it. What happened? It didn't want to be controlled. So it blew up Giovanni's mansion then tried to take over and destroy the world. I am 17 years old, sitting in the Pokemon movie, looking at it going, oh my god, I can't believe they went there. The 10 year old kid next to me is crying his eyes. <laughs> Why Seriously, did we that is a so scary hard. movie. The fact that we created a monster so powerful, it could destroy us, wants to destroy us. How do we stop it? By reintroducing it to the innocence and the purity. The two fight, it learns compassion, sort of, then flies off with Mew, ostensibly to try and eat it. <laughs> who do you remember? Who here is familiar with the sad story of Kangaskhan? Okay, for the record, Ken Sukimori confirmed this is a real thing, they just didn't have the time to encode it. So you know how Cubone wears the skull of its mommy? Yeah. No. Take off the skull, and it kind of looks like the thing living in the Kangaskhan. Originally, if your Kangaskhan got knocked out, I think, three times, it would die, and you'd get a Cubone. The Cubone would evolve to Marowak, would evolve to Kangaskhan, and then the process would continue. The multi-generational Pokémon. That's what they wanted to do. Instead, we get a basic Pokémon that I don't know anyone that uses. <laughs> and a, an extremely morbid small child that wears its mother's skull. <laughs> yeah. Hey, mommy whatever too. splits your boat. This, okay, Spiritomb. Spiritomb is a lot of fun for one major reason. So, when I first encountered it, it was number 108 in its depth. It's like 108, 108 centimeters tall, weighs 108 kilograms. There's a lot of 108 going around this. It consists of 108 souls that are angry. Now, in Buddhism, there are 108 sins that you can commit. If you can purge yourself of all 108 sins, you become a Buddha. But what if you fail? This is 108 souls that have been lost to sin, that have gathered together to create this monstrosity with no weaknesses. This is the Buddha's worst nightmare. <laughs> and it's in Pokemon. <laughs> okay, so, thanks, Slash Bitches. Okay, well, let me just double check how much time I have. No, I'm, I'm ha oh, this is great. Oh, I'm so happy. You're rocking along. I'm going I'm talking about the, the actual monsters. So now we're going to get to the notion of where did they come from. So I've already spent this uh, half an hour basically just rambling on and on about classical mythology. Let's talk a little bit about the Pokemon themselves. Right. So this here is, uh, is a bunch of the Pokemon done up Ukiyo-e style. I found this on DeviantArt, and it's using traditional Japanese woodblock prints to create these beautiful monsters. Mm -hmm. Now, I have a lot to say about the idea of Pokemon as a modern yokai index, but I'll save that for my yokai panel. Mm -hmm. So let's just go on and look at the monsters now. There are 649 of them, but I've always asked myself, where did they come from? How do they get these ideas? What were they smoking? <laughs> can I get some? Only available in Japan? Okay, I can deal with it. Along with a One Piece Domino's pizza box, <laughs> you know what you can get in America that you can get also in Japan? Hero Yui drink. I'll tell you about it later. So, this notion of where did they come from? Well, obviously, look outside. We've got a pigeon. They live by my house. I don't like them. <laughs> a bat. They live by my house. Batman I sort of like them. A rattlesnake. 
They don't live by my house, thank God. <laughs> Rat. My girlfriend keeps one as a pet. Its name is Raticate. Yay. Puppy. What I don't Aww. have but want. <laughs> Um. No, 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 I'll tell you what it's based on. It's based on an animal called the pangolin that lives in Madagascar. It is a burrowing shrew-like creature with poisonous claws. They are poisonous. This is a sand shrew is based on, a ma on an animal from Madagascar that I guarantee will never appear in the movie. Because apparently they think Madagascar is populated by lemurs voiced by Ali G. But I digress. That makes sense. They have cat they have all sorts of stuff that is based on things we see. But there's more. Look into the past and you will find some interesting ideas. So we've got the Pachycephalosaurus Pokemon, the Ceratopsian Pokemon, the Pterodactyl Pokemon, the Megasaur Pokemon, the Archaeopteryx Pokemon. What? Only one of these actually evolves from a fossil, the rest you can just catch. <laughs> Leave it to Japan to turn fashion trends into Pokemon. There are actually three fashion trend Pokemon. One of them shows up later because it crosses in with another concept. But let's see, we've got the gothic Lolita Pokemon, twirling her hair with a bemused expression. And the skater punk Pokemon with the baggy pants and the, and the mohawk. It is fitting seeing as how Gen 5 technically takes place in America. But you know what? You need more inspiration? Look at yokai. There are so many Pokemon that are based on yokai concepts. Yokai? What is that? If you want to know, I'm giving a panel on it later. Huzzah! Yeah. But a lot of the early Pokemon, and even up till today, they would look at their own folklore, find an interesting idea for a Pokemon, and turn it into a creature. Ken Sugimori is brilliant for being able to take those classical images and give them a new life. So what is a kitsune? Well, a kitsune is a shape-shifting fox. So they start out young and innocent, but they can take a lot of different forms. Sometimes they can shape-shift into humans or other creatures, and you won't know it's a kitsune unless it's the last thing in your party. Now, they've been known to grow a lot of tails. The more tails they grow, the more powerful they become. Nine-tailed kitsune can breathe fire. I miss you, Sasuke, so hard! <laughs> <laughs> no! Bad Carl, bad Uncle Yo, no Naruto jokes in a Pokemon panel. <laughs> the last three years of the manga, they've been trying to catch all the tailed boxes. I'm sorry, Naruto has become Pokemon, just like Green Lantern became Pokemon. It's all Pokemon, people. This is the world mythology we live in. <laughs> Are you done? Yeah. <laughs> so, Kitsune, very popular. Uh, yokai type, extremely popular reference for creating different kinds of Pokemon. Sukumogami, artifact god. Now, Ooh. in Shinto mythology, it is said that all things have a spirit. The trees, the water, the people, the air, everything has a spirit. Well, there's a little yeah. creepy part of Shinto that says that if an object becomes very old, it too will develop a soul. If you make the object angry, it becomes an angry soul. It animates the object and then decides to troll you. <laughs> Ban it and shup it. The flavor text basically says, an abandoned doll got angry, turned into a ghost, and now wants to kill us. <laughs> yeah? Now, dust clocks. Yes, it's a cyclops. There is a cyclops in a yokai called the Yamawara cyclops that lives on the side of mountains. But in particular, this is, looks like a Yamawara lantern that has come to life to try and kill us all. Yay. Clay doll is actually based on a Jomon period artifact that they unearthed in early graves. And these artifacts were supposedly representative of the soul of the person living in the artifact. And they could come to life and screw with us if we weren't careful. Now, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of mirror mythology in Japan. One of the imperial regalia was a bronze mirror. A lot of graves have bronze mirrors in there that are meant for spirits to look at them or to keep the spirit energy contained. This one has a pair of eyes and looks ridiculously cute. <laughs> Why did you drop your ice cream cone? Now it's chasing us down the street. <laughs> there is no other reason for that Pokemon except a Tsukumogami ice cream cone. <laughs> Oh, dear. Kappa. The 
Kappa might be the most well-known monster in Japan. They live at the bottom of waters, rivers, and lakes. They like to eat cucumbers. They smell horrible. If a person falls into the river, they will either drown them or shove them back on shore while picking their pockets. <laughs> there are two Pokemon that are based on this notion of the Kappa. Golduck is one of them. I always wonder, Golduck doesn't look anything like a duck. So why is it a duck type? Well, it has webbed feet, it has a beak, I guess. Then I saw a picture of a kappa. Oh, it makes so much sense. Mexican kappa. <laughs> it has a beak, it has webbed feet, it has a sombrero, it uses rain dance to get stronger. It's a kappa. No way around it. It's still not as bad as tequila gum. Nothing is as bad as tequila gun. <laughs> Nothing is as bad as tequila gun. Okay. Thank you. The Speedy Gonzalez Pokemon. Definitely. I'm going to use that the next time I give this talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for giving me that reference. Okay. Kama Itachi. Kama Itachi refers to a, co to a collection of weasels that are aerodynamic and create a whirlwind when they start chasing each other. They slash out with their claws and slice human beings to ribbons. They look like the Lanoon. They have the disposition of the Sneasel. That just happens to be a weasel. I put him in there for that reason and that reason alone. <laughs> I didn't want him to be the only weasel type that wasn't in the weasel slide. That makes sense. All right. Aww. So, like I said, if you want to learn more about yokai, <laughs> I will talk a bit about it later. But there's a yokai called the Futakuchi Ona. <laughs> The two-faced woman. She has one mouth in front, one mouth in back, that never lies, curses like a truck driver, and eats everything in sight. <laughs> that's okay, we have a two-faced, two -face, I guess that's a woman. Can't really see the front, but it's got some hips to die for. <laughs> I guess it's a woman. I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Frost lass. There's a, there's a yokai called the Yuki Ona that lives on mountains, comes with the snow, is highly beautiful and sucks all the heat out of anyone she sets her eyes on. Here we have a coy looking ice Pokemon that lives on the side of mountains that tries to freeze you. I'm completely unrelated. Now, here's the Jinx. Mm -hmm. Jinx is based on the um, Yama Uba, which is another mountain dwelling hag that uses a baby to capture people to eat. Great, that's pretty scary. Oh no, we can't stop there. Remember I said there was a third Pokemon that was based on a uh, fashion trend? When Jinx first came out, she looked like she was wearing blackface makeup, which led the entire country of America to say, RACISM! <laughs> no, no, you see, there's this fashion trend in Japan called Ganburo, <laughs> where girls paint their faces and give themselves these really, these really like obvious expressions, dye their hair gold, and then ride the train like that. <laughs> Jinx was a Yama Uba in Ganguro fashion. America automatically thought it was racism. <laughs> she didn't tap dance or eat watermelon. <laughs> Giga punch it. Second job. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Cats. Cats are awesome, aren't they? How many people here have walked into a Chinese restaurant and seen one of those? Yeah. It's called a Maineki Neko. And it is known as the lucky cat. According to legend, if you put one in your establishment, it will beckon people into the store and they will give you lots of money. Oh. I have one, most of my friends have one. That doesn't bring us any money, but it's cool to have my necky neko. Now, my necky neko was eventually turned into Meowth that uses payday, is constantly beckoning, and talks a lot. <laughs> it also has a gold coin on its head. I'll, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. It also uses payday. The only attack that gets you money. Yeah, yeah until it gets knocked out. <laughs> okay, so this here is the Neko Mata, otherwise known as the Bake Neko, the ghost cat. And according to legend, the Neko Mata, when it achieves a great age, its tail will fork and it will have the ability to screw with your head. <laughs> Using illusions, hypnotism, all sorts of stuff to confuse you. And here we have the Menchi of the Eon family. I know it's supposed to be a fox, it looks like a cat. <laughs> and it uses psychic powers. Now there's also the notion of the Kuro Neko, the unlucky black cat that breaks into your house and steals your stuff. And grins and fashion the stampede. Yes. <laughs> Next. Oh, the Ladies and gentlemen, friend. the worst Sentai team ever. <laughs> <laughs> or the best. <laughs> the Oni Sentai Poke Ranger. 
Let me explain. We'll start with the onigiri ogre. It looks like a rice ball. It has horns. This is the white slash black Poke Ranger. <laughs> Next to it, we have Electabuzz. Electabuzz is based on a particular mm. Oni that is an ogre type that beats mountains down and hurls lightning bolts at people. Mm. It works for Raijin, God of Thunder. We have the Yellow Ranger. Here we have the Blue and the Red Rangers are twins that know martial arts. Originally, Sock and Throw were supposed to have big horns and a more Oni look to them. Sugimori was told to tone it down, so he gave them each a single horn, but gave them the Oni's disposition and penchant for physical violence. Then, then we have Slowbro. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? I'll tell you what it is. There's a creature called the Sazai Oni. Sazai Oni live in shells under the water. And when a sailing ship goes above it, they will come out of their shell, and trick the sailors into going into the water so they can grab them and pull them down and kill them. They are the sirens of Japanese mythology. <laughs> that is definitely, oh, can't you see how sexy it is? <laughs> He's sexy and he knows it. <laughs> but yes, five different types of Oni Pokemon. There are at least three others that I wasn't able to fit into the panel, but these are five different types. Now, birds. Birds are awesome. I love birds. You know what also loves birds? Mythology. There is so much bird mythology out there. Almost every continent has it, be it the feathered serpents or the um, crows or the ravens or some of the other scary stuff. We have the thunderbird. That's obvious. We have not one but two types of phoenixes. This is the Chinese phoenix Huangfang that flies through the sky and creates the world and destroys it. This is the phoenix from Europe that rises from the ashes and turns into Jean Grey. Now, where's phoenix Grey? <laughs> now, the one that confused me, what's the deal with Articuno? How is this thing an ice bird? And then I was reading a book of Arabian myths, and I read about a creature called the Rook. The Rook is a giant white bird from the north that flies into town, bringing with it ice and snow and capsizing boats with its icy fury. They just copied the picture. <laughs> <laughs> so if you were like me and you didn't know where Articuno came from, now you know, and knowing is half the battle. So chill out. The other half of the battle is to use a fire type on it. <laughs> dragons. Who here likes dragons? If you're like me, dragons are awesome. <laughs> they're big, they're powerful, they're strong, they're found everywhere. They're universal. Every single culture, going back to the Lord City of Uruk, 5,000 years ago, had dragons in it. These things are forever found in our world, but there's several different interpretations on how to train your dragon. We've got, <laughs> we've got the Western style. 